My next guests are Grayson McKinney and Zach Rugger. Grayson is an elementary educator from East Grand Rapids, Michigan, who is known for his innovative approaches to teaching and learning and is a true, change, true agent for change. He's a co-author of The Expert Effect, a three-part system to break down the walls of your classroom and connect your students to the world, and the picture book companion, The Expert Ex Expedition. His mission is to empower students to connect their learning to the world in order to improve their own lives, the lives of others, and the environment around them. Zach Rondo is a fourth grade teacher from East Grand Rapids, Michigan as well. His main mission as an educator is to empower his students to be strong, competent kids for more success, happiness, and fulfillment in their lives. He has a master's degree in educational technology and he loves teaching and using technology to deepen learning, enhance creativity, and create opportunities that would otherwise not be possible. Welcome to the podcast, Grayson and Zach. Thank, Thank you so much. Well, I'll start off with, uh, if each of you can tell me about a time you were in the trenches and managed to crawl out, and I think you're going to start, Zach. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks again for having us. Um, so my story of a time when I was in the trenches in education would have been my fourth year teaching. Um, Grayson and I were the only two fourth grade teachers at our school. So um, somewhere along the lines, the idea came up that um, we remove the removable wall that stands between our two classrooms. So that summer, we had the janitor get the two of us co-taught um a class of 56 fourth graders with the two of us in there full time. Um, we also had an amazing student teacher who is now a, a co co colleague of ours who got hired right after. Um, so the three of us went through and had to really rethink every aspect of how we taught because whole group of 56 kids just was not going to work. And I remember us like all summer being so excited about this, going in the room, setting up. We bought and had grants and stuff to buy so much furniture. And then like after the first half day, we like sat down in our chairs and we're completely exhausted. I remember the three of us looking around like, <laughs> what what do we what do we do here? <laughs> like we have to rethink everything. Um, and for those first, I would say the first couple of days, I really felt like in the trenches, but the kids were so excited. Um, they were so flexible and willing to buy into our system and the way we had to tweak things over and over and over again. Um, it ended up being an extremely positive experience. Um, and one in which shaped kind of the changed the way I think about education and shaped many of the philosophies I use today and many of the things that are in um, in the book we wrote together. But at the beginning, we're, we're definitely in the trenches there for, <laughs> for a little sure. bit. Yeah, but it's like taking those risks and then they really pay off. That's what it sounds like. Um, it would have been, you know, difficult at the beginning. I can imagine, you know, that many fourth graders kind of in a combined room, but you all made it work. I'm sure there were some difficult weeks as you learned to kind of navigate that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, um, Grayson, tell me about your trench story. Sure. Well, I'll just share um, my experience with the pandemic. Um, I mean, I know it's it's a, a time that we can all look back on and say that was we were definitely in the trenches. Um, I remember the early days, um, you know, it was spring of 2020 and we got the message saying, you know, we we're going to take it take um, a few days off and we're not sure when we're going to be back. So you need to kind of pack up things that you might need use at home. And that was kind of it. And we kind of left and not didn't know when we were going to see our students again, didn't know when we were going to be back in the classroom again. And, um, you know, it could have been a really, a really, well, I mean, it was a very awful experience for, for many, for many different reasons, but for me, it was one of the most, um, amazing times of collaboration with the team of teachers that I was working with of being able to ask ourselves, what is worth teaching and learning? What is, what are we going to do? Um, you know, with this online, online zoom education, that's going to want, that's going to make students want to sign in and come and see us every day. And, it was. It could have been. It could have been a complete um, failure. But in in my eyes, we got to tap into creativity. We got to um, engage students with passion projects. We got to see students in their homes um, and got to know them on a level that you know might not have been possible otherwise. Seeing, you know, seeing the art that's up on their bedroom walls as they logged in from bed, and you know what books they had on their bookshelves, and you know getting creative like go find something in your house that um, you know reflects your cultural identity, and like being able to just. Kind of strip away the things that um, weren't as essential, things like mm -hmm. um, grading and things like um, you know the, these kind of like formal evaluations of student progress and things. And it, it was a chance for us to connect with students on such a meaningful level. So we got each other through that. And but the collaboration that my team and I um, were able to do, you know, thinking creatively outside of the box, really really stuck with me as a time time in the trenches where we came together. Yeah, definitely. And you know, being able to connect with the students really made a difference, I think, for all the teachers and. You know, for elementary uh, educators, I know the kids have their cameras on a lot more than myself uh, <laughs> in secondary level. But um, yeah, I think, you know, now looking back, you know, there were those silver linings and, um, you know, points of uh, being able to connect definitely was one of those. Mm -hmm. 
So I said in the intro, you collaborated on the book, The Expert Effect, a three-part system to break down the walls of your classroom. Um, since you both teach at the same school, tell me kind of about how the idea for the book got started. Um, you said you co-taught for a while. Um, and so how did everything come together? Um, and what could people uh, take away from the book? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll share. I'll take it way back to the very, very beginning of when we um, actually when we first met. So I had just graduated college and was doing a summer full of interviews and more interviews. And I was on like interview number, I don't know, definitely into the 20s. Um, this was uh -huh. in 2013. And then the school year started and I was doing like a, an aid position. And then somebody left this current school and I got a last minute call to go in and teach a lesson. Um, it's a school I'd already interviewed with once. So I got the last minute call and I went in. Um, I actually walked into Grayson's room to teach my lesson with principals and superintendent in the background, paying attention. Um, and it, it went well because the next day I was teaching next door to Grayson as the other fourth grade teacher. So that's kind of where it like first all started. And then, like I said, four years after that, we co-taught together. Um, and then what really, I, in my mind, we were um, split a position called the building technology chair of our school, which we had to start doing professional development for our own school around technology. Um, and we kind of realized we had like a good rapport and a flow with it. And we took it to district uh, level conferences, then county and then statewide. And we've probably done, I'd say, well over 50 conferences together so far. And as we kept going, I think some people mentioned writing a book. We both have always dreamed of writing a book. So then we reached out to a publisher um, and kind of took it from there. Chris, you want to share anything else? Yeah, it, that was exactly it. Our district had gone one-to-one uh, -one using iPads. And so at first, what we were doing was a lot of technology training, like teaching teachers how to use this new device that not only they, but all their students were going to have. Um, but eventually that, that message of like, um, you know, the, our, the professional development that we're bringing turned from technology training into more of a, like a philosophical shift, like using technology, right. not as a, as, a, as an ends, um, but as a means to an end. So we were looking at seeing how we could use this technology that was going to be in the hands of all of our students and really change the way that we were able to teach and learn. And so we saw it as a meaningful way to, um, you know, change who our students were learning from. And one of those things that we did co-teaching was we started lining up all of these opportunities to um, Skype with experts outside of the classroom uh, because this was before Zoom had taken over as like the, the dominant platform of, of video conferencing. So we were Skyping with um, you know experts from around the world to try to engage, like Zach said, that large group of fourth graders. And the the difference that we saw when students were able to, you know, not only hear the content from us, but then also see how the things that we were teaching them actually applied in the real world and how people use these, whether they're museum curators or engineers or, or scientists, it really made a difference in how um, how engaged our students were and, and the relevance of the content. Um, and so, yeah, it, some some of those ideas became blog posts and we started a blog. And then, um, you know, at, after a certain point, we said, you know what, I think we've got kind of the three part vision of how this all, all connects. And so, Zach, do you want to share some of the other? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the first phase in the book is to uh, get our students to learn from outside uh, um, experts and then part of enough knowledge. We really want the students to become the expert through project-based learning. So trying to encourage them like, all right, okay, we have this base level of knowledge. What's a driving question in this realm that you can dive in um, deeper? And then what, what can you create with your knowledge? What can you make? What can you gain throughout this whole process? And then finally, once they have become the expert, they have a product, they have something that they created. We don't want it that part three is how do we get them to share their work with an authentic audience? How can we get them, um, give them a platform or some way that they can um, showcase their work? And we do that um, to be proud of their work that we want them to, it's like a celebration of how far they've come, how much they've learned. And we, like they started learning from an expert. Now we want them to teach like an expert. Yeah, so you have um, a little bit about like um, how people can get started as well. Um, you know, is some of it just bringing in a lot of these speakers, like you said, as simple as like having, you know, either Zooms or, you know, Skypes with guest speakers. Um, but also bringing in project-based learning or are there other things to consider? So I know that all teachers love acronyms. And so we, we saw the expert effect as, a, as the opportunity to bring in our own like virtual checklist of the type, the type of people that we're looking for. So when we say experts, we're talking about people who are you know really experienced in this field. They're energetic. They're able to talk to kids. And we, you know, we encourage people to not just like, you know, find random experiences that kind of sound cool, but again, ones that like tie into the, um, to the, your units of study. So whatever you're, you're learning on or whatever the students are interested in, it, it becomes, um, the teacher becomes like an information agent putting in, putting what they need. Um, so yeah, it is. And it can be bringing people in, it can be virtually connecting with them or, um, you know, as we say in the book, even better is taking your class to the field and going on those field trips 
um, you know, not just to the zoo because it's a nice day and it would be fun to have a picnic, but to talk to the um, zoologist who's going to help them understand, you know, the report that they're creating about their their animal or their endangered species or whatever. So, <laughs> yeah. And then another thing I'd like to add is a lot of times in our um, presentations, this has happened in, in many of them, especially the last couple we've done, somebody will walk up at the end, they say, I like I filled my whole notebook with all these ideas um, that I'm going to reinvent next school year for this whole thing. And as much as that brings us joy and happiness to see that people are taking the ideas and putting to action, we always encourage people to start with one of your units. Don't try to reinvent every single thing you do. All would really lend itself well to project-based learning and start there and think about what speaker or field trip could you bring in for that one? What project or something could students create around that topic? And then once you do it one time, you really figure out the flow and what works for you, um, what tweaks you can, you can make. Um, um, throughout, we've also done experiences where the expert speaking to the expert isn't right at the beginning. It's also like after they've studied a little while or after they're in the project phase. So it doesn't have to go in that one, two, three um, <clears throat> order, but just just starting small. And then as you experiment and dab with it, dreaming big and keep keep pushing yourself. Yeah. To and like Zach said, it doesn't always need to be at that immersion phase. Um, some of the most successful uses of these outside experts that I've seen have actually been um, at the end. Um, after the students have produced something. And so then having the experts come in and give them feedback or hearing their ideas, um, it's really empowering for the students to see themselves as like, wow, I'm I'm having an actual conversation with this person and they're telling me what I can do, you know, what I can work on or things to think about or, you know, how my how my ideas are actually being applied in the real world. So at, at any phase, um, having a, an outside expert can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. And um, do you give tips for uh, secondary teachers um, in bringing these in as well? Is it mostly on the job? So a lot of the um, examples that are in the book are from our own uh, our own school. So that would be a, it's a K through five school. But um, both Zach and I have also um, for the last two summers consecutively worked with um, sixth through twelfth graders. So we've okay. been um, and all of these the same ideas completely apply. Um, the first summer we did what was called the um, the Oakland School Youth Innovation Lab, where students were coming in with these passion project ideas, and then um, you know as the the teachers, Jeps and guest speakers to come and um, talk to them about their topics in in the uh, in helping students come up with these projects that they would then showcase to the community. Um, so in different districts around uh, our county in Michigan. Um, uh, but yeah, oh, I was gonna add one thing with the like um, in the secondary level, I know a big challenge is that you have your students depending on school and set up for like 45 minutes to an hour at a time um, where you think it, it, it's hard to get a guest speaker to come speak to five different classes in a row. So kind of something yeah. we've um, recommended is like, if you do it virtually recording the session with one class, uh, showing it to the others and trying to sprinkle it. So like each of your classes can have one of those experiences um, in person, but watch, can see the other ones recorded. Would be yeah, gathering gathering questions from different sections ahead of time too, so that the one section who's, who's getting it live is able to ha have their questions uh, still reflected there. Um, as another as another tip, um, but in the book we do share like a lot of resources that we've used, and some of those would, would um, completely apply to the secondary level too. Yeah, I know when I was working with um, middle schoolers, for example, last summer, and I had a group who wanted to design a home recycling station. So it would be like kind of like that single stream recycling. They wanted to create something where you could put in a can or a cardboard box, and the it would be so sorted by artificial intelligence. And so that was a little bit beyond my engineering ability. So like going to one of the resources that we suggest in the book, um, skypeascientist.com, we were able to put them in touch with a material scientist from Carnegie Mellon, uh, who was talking about, you know, design choices and, you know, the possibilities of using solar panels, um, because that was the the area of, of, of her work at, at the university. So um, definitely, Taught, speaking above a middle school level, um, but then once she understood their project, like was able to tailor it to, to their needs, so. Yeah, and I, so I think a lot of what you outline in the book uh, kind of answers those logistical questions for um, you know teachers at any level, but especially if you're teaching the same class period four or five times and the speaker's only there. And I know sometimes they get a huge group of kids and take them to the auditorium, which could also be a possibility. When you talk mm -hmm. about gathering questions, that's a good idea as well. Um, I did want to talk about the children's book release, the Excer Expert Expedition. Um, so what is this book about? Yeah. Uh, Zach, you've been uh, using some of your ideas on the student web podcast. Yeah, so well. um, writing the first book, it's, um, you know, a, a larger chapter book primarily for teachers, but the goal is to get, you know, teachers, inspire teachers to kind of change their, um, their teaching to impact kids. Um, and once we wrote it, we had the idea, we've seen some other books that have a companion children's book, and we had this idea to break their learning, 
um, undergo some sort of project-based learning experience, even a passion project on their own at home over the summer. Um, it could go along with school. And we wanted to inspire them. So we kind of had this idea. We both wanted to make a rhyming book. And then as Grayson mentioned, we both worked with high school and middle schoolers uh, a couple summers ago in a district that neither of us had ever met. Um, and Grayson saw her doodling and one of her passions in this program was art. So we asked if she you know, was an artist and if she'd be interested. And she, she was a little nervous, but she absolutely knocked this project out of the park. She is, we are so lucky to have connected with her. She brought our vision to life and just like such a, a magical, um, magical way to match everything we had in mind. So she's, her name is Soraya Ali Ahmed, and she's just been a joy to work with. Grace, you want to add more? Um, I'll just hold up the the cover so you can see. Yeah, just like amazing. She's a secondary ELA teacher, but um, yeah, as you can, you can tell from these pictures, uh, art is her, is her calling, I think. And all the illustrations in the book and being able to actually work with the illustrator and talk, talk about our vision and our experience. She was able to, every page of the book was illustrated with um, projects that students that we've taught have actually undertaken. So even though there's a strong fantasy element with some of her illustrations, she makes it so whimsical, um, you know, pictures of like students designing websites and um, starting podcasts, as you mentioned, uh, or taking, you know, taking these field trips. It's all based on things that our students have done. So when we actually, um, you know, middle school students who come back to visit us, they're like, oh my gosh, this is, this is us. They saw themselves in the pages and the things that they had done um, when, when they were in our classrooms. Um, examples of like being on stage, you know, and performing a play that students had written to show their learning about Black History Month or um, a picture of our, our gymnasium filled with tables, um, you know, full of pro products um, based on their work uh, studying entrepreneurship. And so it's just like, it's it's so cool. It's basically our, our career captured one of, in One of the most gratifying of the form, so. things of this is Grayson and I both received an email uh, last week from an 11th grader who was in our co-taught classroom. Um, she sent us an email that she read the book and that she could remember things we did in, when she was in fourth grade in our classrooms based on the book, which was like, we've gotten a lot of good feedback. I'd say that was my favorite feedback that I've yeah. received yet. Yeah. Shout out to goes back seven years and you know i mean those things like yeah that really stand out and that you're able to capture that uh with the work of the history is is great for those students um, so i did mention um zach you you're still participating grace and you've done the student web podcast um some but um it's been around since 2018 so um what is a podcast about how often do you record with your students yeah this has been in my career i'd say like my favorite project that I've ever taken on with students. And it started as um, I attended a two day um, project based learning seminar as a part of this teacher leadership program I was in. Um, and they challenged us to come up with a big idea for a project we could we could take on. So um, in going through it, I've I just wanted to give my students a platform in some way in which they could share their learning um, with the world. And the, one of the reasons it came up is because I'm an avid podcast did. And I thought, well, I would love to have my students make one. Now that idea came to mind. I had no, I really didn't know how to make a podcast. I'd never thought about making one um, before. And then one of my favorite education podcasts, Kelly Croy, that like, I'm not, you know, like stars align, like the day I like had this idea, I told the parents at curriculum that I was going to do it. And then he released an episode that like literally that night of how to make a podcast, like the nuts and bolts of how to make it and taught me about this tool, um, anchor.fm, which gave me that. But going on off of that, like learning from experts, I contacted him. Um, I had met him before, and he was willing to Skype in with my class and teach not only my class about how to make a podcast, but then teach me how to make a podcast kind of in front of my class and give us all these tips and tricks um, and how he does it and the things that he had learned. So him coming in, like inspired not only the students, but also me and then also made it kind of a, accountable. But I'd say with the podcast, our goal from the beginning, um, my idea was we have a morning meeting every day and students discuss wise words quotes and the things they would like say and connect it to. That was my idea. Like, how do I get these conversations out to the world? Because they really were inspiring um, the things like nine and 10 year old kids were saying Kept along that theme. Um, but I'm, I also just kind of use it as a general platform. So if our class does a, a project and kids want to share about a project they've learned um, relating to content or curriculum, we do. We've done many episodes like that. Um, I wanted to document during the pandemic, like, what is a kid's view of what's happening in our world? So I recorded some candid conversations um, of me talking to kids about them. And there's like a four part series of just like what they were going through to kind of capture that in like a historical perspective. 
Um, but when I first started, I remember getting like, like pe people can listen to this. It's, it's on the internet. Um, yeah. I didn't really, I didn't really know if that would happen or not. And then we published our first episode. I remember tweeting it and getting a few retweets. And then the next day, like I looked on the, uh, the, the analytics and it already reached like five or six different countries in, in one day. Um, and to date we've continued making episodes. We make, I don't know, probably five to seven per school year. It's not something we do every week. Um, it is, it is timely, but to date it's, it has over 5,000 downloads and reached, I, I think about 45 to 50 countries, um, all over. So, um, so it's just been like a really exciting way for me to give my students that platform and let them inspire and teach the world like experts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know a lot of teachers have started student-led podcasts, maybe, you know, once they get to a new school year, kind of abandon that, but you've kept it going these several years. Um, you know, you don't publish that often, but just kind of that idea of getting those messages out there, you know, and, and staying with it, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's great for motivational for the students as well. Yeah, thanks. So I wanted to ask each of you about um, any presentations that will be coming up. Um, in May, June, or July are conferences that, you know, you might not have submitted anything yet, but, um, or know if you're speaking there, but that you tend to speak at uh, during the summer months. Um, we do, yeah, we do quite a few locally uh, in Michigan. We have nothing directly, uh, uh, officially on the calendar yet. Um, but if you check when this comes out, if you check our website at experteffectedu.com, we'll definitely keep that updated with our, with our upcoming things. We got, we got a few coming up um, before then that we're excited about. Yeah, you can hey, find great. us at that website, experteffectedu.com, um, or also on Twitter. Um, my username is gmckinney2, and we also have an Instagram account where we show, share pictures of ongoing projects and final projects um, that our students have been doing at experteffectedu uh, on Instagram. Great. I'll make sure to put those in the show notes. Well, as we wrap things up today, I'd like to ask each of you, um, out of everything we talked about in terms of the projects with the kids, uh, your book, and um, your trench story. Uh, what's one thing you'd like listeners to remember? I'll start with you, Teresa. Sure. I think um, it's just, you know, when you combine um, the excitement of learning from experts and showing kids that the work that they do in school can actually have bearing on the world, um, like students, like Zach's students uh, podcast has, it, it changes the effect. It changes the feeling in the classroom. It changes what, um, you know, going to school means for them. And it's it can be such a powerful uh, a powerful um, shift in in vision for the students and for the teachers. So try it out. Start small. Um, you know, look for those opportunities to, um, like Zach said, choose a, choose a single unit, choose a single uh, lesson that where you want to um, bring in these outside voices or give students the chance to share their voices, and just magical things can happen. Great, great. How about you? Yeah, I think um, I was just kind of jotting down the four big things I talked about, um, and with our you know, with our co-teaching story, with podcasting, with starting presenting, all of those for me stem from one thing. And that's, that's starting by taking a risk. Um, all mm -hmm. those things at the beginning kind of had that like uncomfortable feeling of like, I don't, I don't know how this is going to go. This could, but all four of those things would be like some of the most gratifying um, experiences I've had in education. They've all started by taking that leap and taking that risk. So find a place you can start and uh, take that risk and dive in and magical things can happen. Great, great. Well, it's been a pleasure having both of you on the Out of the Trenches podcast today. Have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much.